Okay, we are officially recording now. Well, it is my great pleasure to introduce, and she doesn't need an introduction to many of you, uh, our speaker for today. Actually, when we decided it's time for me not to be the speaker anymore and get outside speakers, the first, first top of my list was my dear friend, Lenora Larson, who is a fellow EMG down in Miami County, the Marriage and Scene uh, Extension Master Gardener Group. Of course, uh, she is an avid um, contributor to the Kansas City Gardener, an avid gardener, um, all things uh, healthy, beneficial uh, for the garden, a wonderful garden gardener. I know we took a tour to her property, oh my gosh, way too long ago, and it's time we do mm -hmm. that again. Absolutely. And, yes, and uh, Lenore has a number of different topics for uh, repertoire of presentations. She is an interesting, a day not dynamic, and speaker. So I am sure we will all enjoy uh, Lenora's presentation on the No Sow Gardener. And just for your um, matter of fact, Lenora, we're up to about 160 people. Oh, nice. On, on our Zoom today. So even though you feel like you're talking to no one, there's the <laughs> audience out there. So I will turn it over right. to you. Wonderful. I'm so glad to join you. Now, when we hooked up today, we did decide, find out we are having one slight technical difficulty and that the slides are not advancing at the speed that you see compared to the speed that I have. So we're using Karen's finger as the signal of when you can see each slide as it goes forward. So, um, so this is an example of one of my gardens and many of you have seen my gardens. And here in the Midwest, of course, we're not supposed to ever brag about ourselves or brag about anything we do, but I'm just gonna brag about my garden because I don't really do it. You know, I, I'm famous for how much I hate to plant. And so I have about a three acre garden that is full of blazing color from mid-April to mid-November without me planting. Now, I've spent 20 some years figuring out how to accomplish this. Now, I'm assuming that all of you are what I would call landscape gardeners. I mean, you may have a vegetable garden, but some of the horticultural techniques I'm going to talk about should never be applied in the garden. In fact, just the opposite. So just that one caveat, we are talking about your flower garden, not your vegetable garden. And so as an example, you see here all of these beautiful flowers and every year they come up because they are self-sowing annuals. And most gardeners in my experience, they have this attitude about annuals. I mean, even when I mention annuals, some of you are probably wrinkling your noses in disgust because you think that means that you have to plant each one of these hundreds or in my case, thousands of flowers each spring. Well, absolutely not. Um, well, first of all, I hate to plant and it is genetic. My mother, the landscape designer also hated to plant. I love to dig in the dirt and I love to dig holes. I just hate putting a plant in it. And so for me, I had to find a way of having color. Color is the king. For most of us who do landscape gardening, our first priority is the aesthetics. I mean, yes, we, want, we, we care about the design and yes, we care about horticultural um, principles, but we care most about how does it look and does it meet our standard of beauty? And everybody has their own idea of what beauty is but for most of us, it is color, right? It's all about the color. And yes, you can get color in your hardscaping and color from foliage. You see there my castor beans. I have a lot of foliage color, but really the king of color is your flowers. And now with all of the emphasis on pollinators, um, that also means we're doing good for the planet. Every time you satisfy, satisfy your lust, for color, you're also making pollinators very happy. So here's what we're going to talk about. First of all, some definitions. Uh, we haven't made it easy for gardeners to know what is an annual and what is a perennial and does it make a difference? And yes, it does. And then I'm gonna show you some of my proven self seeders. Uh, some of you will have moments of apoplexy and heart failure when you see things like my dame's rocket, the, the lavender flowers, we'll talk more about that. And then probably the most important section is the horticultural techniques. Um, 
because many of you are killing all of next year's flowers with what you do to your gardens in the fall. You gotta, you gotta change that if you want this kind of color and no work. And then finally, um, some sources of seeds for you and some final thoughts. And Karen is going to be monitoring the chat room. And when you have questions, she's going to signal me and we will get those questions answered right away. So here we go. Um, first of all, the easy one, perennial plants. What is a perennial plant? By definition, it is a plant that lives more than two years. If it only lives two years, it's a biennial, and usually the first year is vegetative growth, and the second year the flowering stalk appears, produces seeds, and then they die. The perennial plants, the, the roots come back. The growth comes from the roots every spring, year after year after year. And of course, there are perennials that only live three or four years, and then there's perennials like trees that live even a thousand years. We divide the perennials into two groups, herbaceous, which means they have soft stems, and then the woodies, and that's our shrubs and our trees with their woody stems that don't die to the ground. They just drop their leaves in most cases. So the life cycle of a perennial, starting from a seed, foliage, flower, seeds, and then here in our temperate climate, they take a little rest. Usually that's over winter, but there are perennials that do their rest during the heat of the summer. And then they start growing again from the roots, foliage, flower, seeds. And yes, many of these perennials do seed also, but the perennial part of it is coming back from the roots. Now in contrast, the annual plants by definition are plants that complete their growth cycle in just one growing season. And so you can influence how long they bloom by deadheading, but you cannot influence how long they live. And most of you know, there's no point in digging up a zinnia and take it into the greenhouse for the winter. It is all genetically programmed already to die. And so their life cycle, seed, foliage, flower, seed, death, very simple. But of course, the seeds live on forever. And so if you think about it, why are annuals so much more floriferous than perennials? Well, it's all about their winter strategy. How are they going to get through our winters? Perennials do it by sending most of the resources down to the roots. So the roots will have the strength and the energy first to get through the winter and then to start growing again in spring. Annuals do it by producing as many seeds as possible to live through the winter. And what that means then as their winter strategy to get more seeds, you get more, you make more flowers. And so their focus is on making flowers. And most annuals will bloom not in just days or weeks like the perennials, but in weeks and even months of bloom time. Very different strategy, and it all goes back to how are we going to make it through the tough times. So we've confused things, though. In fact, I remember my first class in 2010 with Dennis, and Dennis asked our group, um, all brand new, hoping to soon be master gardeners, uh, what is an annual plant? And of course, I always want to be head of the class, so I'm waving my arms and, and saying, well, it's a plant that lives only one year. And, you know, so that's the botanical definition. But horticulturally, um, we gardeners call any plant that doesn't survive our winter an annual. But it's not really. I mean, a lot of, a lot of what we call annuals are killed by the frost, not by their genes. They would live on forever. And so here in the photograph, you're seeing three examples of perennial plants that many of you will call annuals because the vertigo, the vertigo grass, that black grass, absolutely fabulous. Um, it's going to die in the winter cold, but you can dig it up and take it into the greenhouse and it will live on year after year. Likewise, the sort of red leaves, that's the mahogany splendor hibiscus. And it doesn't even bloom in our climate. We don't have a long enough, hot enough growing season. But again, you can take it into the greenhouse. It is not an annual, it is a true perennial. And then of course the lantana, uh, it breaks all of our hearts that lantanas are not winter hardy here. 
Uh, that's Miss Huff, and Miss Huff sometimes will come back from the roots, but not dependably. I'm, I'm still having to buy a flat of them every year. So the difference then for these tropical, well, you're going to call them annuals, I'm going to be a botanist and call them perennials, is that they really, most of them don't function as the self-sowing flower. Um, our growing season doesn't allow them to flower or develop ripe seeds. And even if they do produce seeds, usually those seeds are not winter hardy. So are there annuals that don't work as self-sowers? Well, absolutely. First of all, hybrids. Hybrids are a cross between two different species. And hybridization is a natural process. I mean, man did not invent hybridization. Many plants are promiscuously adventuring with each other, just naturally growing out in the wild and forming new hybrids. But the thing about hybrids is they don't usually come true from seed. And so the next year's offspring do not look like the hybrid that you planted. And many times um, they are sterile. They may have nectar and pollen, so they still work for the pollinators, but they don't produce viable seeds. And so I also encourage people to not insist that every flower in their garden be open pollinated uh, and be fruitful. I mean, you can, in your garden, you can have plants that are for you, even if they don't work for pollinators. It's your garden. And like these dreamland zinnias, I am totally in love with, and I put in two flats of them every year. As much as I hate planting, I'm on my knees snarling and cursing, but planting dreamland zinnias because I gotta have them, they're part of my vision. So which annual flowers are gonna work for you? Well, first of all, they have to reproduce by seed. And yes, they may do some rhizomes and some may have bulbs, but we're talking about the open pollinated seed producers. So those seeds, first of all, you get the genetic mixing. And then secondly, they spread all around your garden on their own. To some of you, that is a vice. To me, that is very much a virtue. I want, when I read in a catalog, self-sowing invasive thug, I immediately order that plant. That is my kind of plant because I know that they are going to take responsibility for their own procreation and I'm not going to have to plant them year after year. And then again, as I said before, those seeds must survive our winters. So another way of thinking about these plants is just if you're looking, you know, it's, sometimes it can be hard to find the plants you want, these self-sowing plants. So you look for the words open pollinated, and that means that the plant produces pollen, which is, you all are clear on this, pollen is plant sperm, and it's spread either by the wind or by pollinators in temperate zones, that's usually insects, and taken then to the stigma, the receiving uh, receptacle female part of the same species of plant. And that's the thing about open pollination. It has to go from the same species. So going from zinnia to cleome to marigold is not going to do anybody any good. It has to be zinnia to zinnia to zinnia, cleome to cleome to cleome, marigold to marigold to marigold. You get the point. And the reason that bees are the pollinators is because hardwired in their little DNAs is they are flower faithful. No other critters are flower faithful. So bees every morning, whether they are a solitary bee or a social bee like honeybees, they decide which is the flower of the day and that is the flower that they visit. And so that almost ensures efficient pollination. Butterflies are, are kind of like a dog when it sees a squirrel, you know, it's like squirrel and they just, wherever, whatever catches it attention, the color or the fragrance, usually the color for butterflies. And so they are not species, you know, faithful at all. And so they're not nearly as efficient pollinators, but of course we love them anyway. When you're beautiful, you can get away with a lot. So when you see a garden full of self-sowers, you are also by definition going to have a pollinator garden. And one of the ways you know if you're visiting other gardens, whether or not these are um, self-sowing plants is whether or not there are pollinators visiting them. You know, a, a garden should be full of life, full of especially bees, 
And then we call them flower flies. They are the bee mimics. They look like bees and your flowers should be covered with them. So another term we use for open pollinated plants is heirloom flowers. And so think about what your great grandmother, I used to be able to say grandmother, but now it's great grandmother, what kinds of flowers she grew, saved the seeds, and then passed them along and planted them herself. Now, make no mistake, these heirloom flowers that you can buy the seeds from, from for instance, seed companies, or you get from friends or from grandmothers, uh, they are not the same as the original species. They have been selected Usually, you know, granny's not dumb. Granny picks the brightest flower, the largest flower, the earliest blooming flower, whatever traits she values, she is going to choose the flowers to collect seeds from that made her the happiest. And so over the 50 years, for instance, that there's going to be considerable change into the human perspective, uh, improvements in these flowers. You know, they're still genetically, for instance, a, a zinnia or a cleome, but they're not the same as the original because they've been chosen for specific attributes through the years. So the biggest reason to me for using the self-seeding annuals is they are self-sustaining and then you are guaranteed this beauty. And so this is a garden that I planted in 2008. I still have it. And uh, I could have taken this, well, it's a little early to get, the balsam is the magenta flower. Um, and they're just starting to bloom right now. But that's balsam and zinnia angustifolia and orange profusion zinnias. And so I think we need to talk about some of the flowers that I know from my experience are really gonna perform for you. These annuals, not only do they have the self-sustaining beauty, they also have a long, blooming period. And so my marigolds have already started growing and blooming, and they're still going to be in bloom in November. And there are a lot of pollinators still out there in late October, even after a light frost, that are hungry and thirsty, and they need these flowers. And of course, me, you know, I'm sort of like a magpie. I want everything to be bright and shiny. I need those flowers too. I also believe it or not, count on self-sowing annuals for my containers. I do not have to plant my containers every year. They plant themselves using the same horticultural techniques and the same flowers. For instance, there's white zinnia angustifolia in the ground, and then the white zinnia angustifolia in the container performing in two very different applications, but successfully for sure. Now, it isn't just our store-bought ornamental plants, there are a lot of native plants that are also um, self-sustaining, self-sowing native annuals. And um, the advantage of them, for instance, here, the burr marigold, the partridge pea, and the goatweed, these are all also butterfly host plants. And one of the advantages of having a lot of native plants is, because it's, you know, you all know this, it's a total myth that they are less maintenance. That is just not true. You can't say that as a blanket statement. It depends on which plant you're talking about. And it also requires that you plant, for instance, a native sunflower in the same environment that it grew in naturally to get that same drought tolerance, for instance. Um, but using any of the native plants, you're more likely to also be having a host plant for either a butterfly or a moth. And of course, in my garden, that's a good thing. So let's meet some of these. Now, most people, I bet all of you know impatiens, right? And impatiens, uh, wonderful plant. I still love them. Uh, plant snobs start, you know, it's so ironic to me that when a plant is really successful, a lot of gardeners start sneering at it. It's like, they, they like plants that are difficult to grow, that they have to coddle, that they can brag about, but see, I, I like plants that are really, as I said, self-sustaining and do the job and I can just admire them and keep them trimmed and looking good. You know, I, I love to groom. I just don't like the plant. So impatience, impatience is the bedding impatience you already know. Impatience balsamina, aha. 
Impatience and patience does self-seed a little, but not enough to really matter in your garden. Impatience balsamina is one of the best self-sowers out there. It will grow in both shade and sun, as long as it has enough moisture. It comes in four different glorious colors, and it, it exemplifies all of the virtues of a self-sowing flower, but also the vice for some of you, because um, one of its common names is touch me not. And if you touch the seed pod when it's ripe, it explodes and throws seeds even several yards. And so you will have balsamina all over your yard. Well, I love to weed, so I am a happy person. Unfortunately, just as impatience, impatience now is susceptible to the impatience wilt, this also is. So it used to be the perfect plant that I could really count on in my garden, uh, but now I have to watch. And as soon as I see a balsam starting to wilt, I rip it out and put it in the burn barrel. Of course, my castor beans. Um, this is a hybrid called dwarf blue. I've tried some other castor beans. There's some that have pretty, the carmesita has beautiful flowers, but it's still, to me, it's the foliage color. And I haven't found any other castor bean other than dwarf blue that has this rich a burgundy color. Uh, I got the seeds from my mother and she was gardening in Florida and there it is a perennial and very invasive. Here, uh, it dies in the winter, but the seeds, hooray, hooray, live on. And this is another one that if you touch the ripe cluster of seeds, it explodes and it will throw seeds literally yards away all over your garden. Now, again, to me, that is an excellent situation because Mother Nature does much better at deciding on interesting plant combinations than I do. And so I just love to see where plants think they're going to be happiest. I sincerely believe that when a plant has chosen its place, rather than you foisting your will on it, when the plant has chosen its place, it's going to be happier and healthier. And you come up with all kinds of different combinations that you never would have thought of. Now I know the control freaks are, are not having a good time with this, but it's, it's a way of just being more in touch with how plants really want to grow and what their preferences are. So many of you are familiar with Colosia or Celosia, and uh, this originally started 25 years ago as the cauliflower form. You know, it looks like a red brain, but as it naturalized, it's gone all to the feather form, which I am perfectly okay with. Um, and when they come up, you'll see that the stems are three different colors. If it has a yellow stem as a seedling, it's going to have yellow flowers, but they're not really very bright. And so I rip those out because I love to weed anyway. And then it will have an orange stem and that's going to have green leaves and red flowers or a red stem and starting to have red leaves already. And this is what you get, this brilliant red foliage as well as the red flowers. And this contributes so much to the color of the garden when you get that double hit of both the foliage and the flowers. Uh, and pollinators like it, even though it looks like a little eeny teeny flower, a lot of the pollinators are very small bees and very small syrphid flies, and they will just cluster all over it. Um, another one that uh, the seeds are very, very small and travel wide distances. Uh, and so again, it's, it's truly, um, for a lot of people, an invasive thug but that's what I like. So Cleomay, uh, common names like spider flower. Um, another common name is grandfather's whiskers, which I think is really cute. And um, I still use the original species Cleomay. They are rampant self-sowers. And so a lot of people don't like them for that. Uh, you can get the little uh, miniature Rosalita. And I think there's a new series, Dennis, um, besides Rosalita. But anyway, they're, they're sterile and they're short and they don't spread. And you have to buy them plant by plant nursery, so very expensive. And again, I like to see where they want to be and I let them choose where they want to be. And the thing with Cleome is I have an agreement with the flea beetles. Flea beetles adore Cleome. And of course, Cleome self-sows in, I mean, literally in carpets. And so the we 
we have this agreement. The flea beetles eat most of the cleomae, and so the ones that survive that then grow up and they're perfectly spaced. I mean, if you can just relax and work with mother nature, it really does eliminate an awful lot of work. Cosmos, well, um, they do sell so nicely. I am much happier with the orange one they call sunny red, but of course it's obviously not red. Uh, it stays short and it usually starts emerging in May and is blooming by middle of June. So pretty quick to go from seed to flower and um, the tall, the bipinnatus, that one sometimes will get six or seven feet tall. So it's flopping all over and doesn't flower until July or August. So I, even though it meets the criteria, I'm not as fond of it. But if you have a really tall border and you have these at the back of the border, uh, they come in beautiful colors, the white, the pink, and the burgundy. And so if it, if it works in your garden, I still can recommend them. Okay, I know, invasive, noxious weed, uh, but it isn't in my garden. And, and so for me to get it to move to another part of my garden, I have to wait until the seed heads have ripened and actually carry a seed head over and put it in the new space. They do not spread on their own. So I don't, and I, I don't know, love to hear ideas from people. Um, most of us who have it in a, an ornamental garden, it does not spread wildly, but it gets going out in the edges of woodlands and you'll see it along roads being very invasive. And I just caution people, there are people who philosophically do not want invasive noxious weeds in their gardens. So this would not be a choice for you. But the pollinators absolutely adore it. It blooms for a good solid two months in late April on to really the first of June. And so it can really be a, a strong spring workhorse for you. Um, the delphiniums, this is called larkspur, they're the uh, annual, and a lot of them will, in fact, a lot of them, the individual plants come up in the fall and then over winter and then start blooming um, in the spring, but some don't come up until spring, but this is another rampant self-sower, and so some people don't like it for that reason. It comes in at least four colors that I know of, but I rip out everything except the blue and the pink. That's what I want to focus on. Uh, it does need some moisture, as you see on the, on the list there, and um, it'll bloom, 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 and then suddenly die. That's just its nature. And so if possible, you want to be able to be there to rip it out because the minute it turns brown, the seeds are ripe. And so you can go ahead, instead of having to leave it for seeds to ripen, you can go ahead and start cleaning it up right away. Because it goes from being just drop dead gorgeous to being really ugly pretty quickly. Uh, marigolds. Okay. All marigolds are not the same. And so the marigolds that you usually see in the garden centers are what we call French marigolds or French brocade. Those are sterile tetraploids. They do not produce seeds. They are of no use to pollinators. So you have to look for what I would call the species marigold, which is Tagetes petula, and uh, the lemon marigolds and the uh, African tall marigolds. Those are all hybrids and they don't work. So it needs to be this specific species, but boy, is this another wonderful for both you and the pollinators. Uh, it comes in this yellow. It also comes in kind of a bronzy uh, orange color. And um, you'll have flowers from end of May all the way through middle of November. And it's not as obnoxious as some of the others I've shown you. I mean, very little weeding necessary. Melampodium. And I had to look it up because I've always known it as melampodium. It, one of the common names is butter daisy, uh, but a wonderful self-sowing little plant. It only gets about a foot tall and it makes these wonderful um, mounds in your garden and the pollinators really, really like it. Uh, love in a mist. Um, and the seed heads are also very beautiful. You saw that in one of my opening slides. And those little black seeds are what they use in string cheese for those black seeds that are in string cheese. They're actually nigella seeds. 
And I also use nigella seeds to substitute for poppy seeds in poppy seed bread and poppy seed desserts. Uh, it comes in white, pink, and blue, but I rip out everything but the blue. And it is one of the few plants that really is a true beautiful blue, a wonderful plant. It only blooms for about 10 days, very short for an annual, but it's certainly worth having in the garden because it's gonna bloom in early May when not much else is going yet. Ah, Nicotiana, the flowering tobacco. Now, for those of you who don't know, it is in the tomato family. This makes it especially near and dear to my heart because members of the tomato family are the host for the hummingbird moths. And you have seen their caterpillars on your tomato plants, what you call the tomato hornworm. And here in the Midwest, it's usually actually a species called the tobacco hornworm, but that differentiation is mostly of interest to insect nerds like me. Um, but that beautiful, huge green caterpillar becomes the hummingbird moth. And so to me, that's very special and I love them dearly and I would never kill one. What you should do is plant a tomato plant just for the hornworms, keep all the flowers picked off, Keep it well fertilized so it will have beautiful dark green leaves. It will be the healthiest tomato plant in your garden. And so the mother hummingbird moth almost always lays her eggs on her plant because it looks like the best plant for her babies. And then if she makes a mistake and lays eggs on one of your tomato plants, all you have to do is pick up the caterpillar. They don't bite, they don't sting. We don't actually know why they have that tail or their spine and just carry them over. I pet them, of course. Uh, and put them on the tomato plant or the Nicotiana, or if you have Datura, that's also in the tomato family. Um, and so it also can be a host. So in your garden, you'll find two different species. These are the species, not those pitiful, ugly, short little hybrids. Not that I have any opinions. Uh, the tall one, the Nicotiana sylvestris, beautiful, they grow six to eight feet tall with these white flowers that smell like gardenias. Um, and one of their common names, and I usually hate common names, but this common name is only the lonely. Isn't that wonderful? Um, the common, more common Nicotiana is uh, Nicotiana alata, and they get about 30 feet tall, come in lots of different colors of flowers, again, a fragrance like uh, gardenias, and both of these self-sow, especially the alata. If you buy those little dwarfed hybrids at the nurseries, they are not going to self-sow, and they don't have the fragrance. Um, these are primary flowers for, night, for the night flying pollinators. And in fact, the hummingbird moths are one of the main pollinators for night blooming flowers of all kinds. Okay, another, now, okay, I'll admit it. This one is a thug. Perella may be, I mean, there's lots of contenders for this title, but Perella may be the most invasive self-sower out there. Uh, and so I warn people, uh, it does come in both green and burgundy. I would not call that purple. I put a very high standard on what purple is. Um, but again, they just sell so everywhere and they will revert to green if you don't watch it. So anytime I see a green one come up, I immediately uh, weed that out. But they come up in such thick mats that instead of getting to their usual 30 inches tall, they will actually stay a thick mat of burgundy ground cover that no other weed can penetrate. Um, it is also a, a culinary plant. It's called shizo in China, and it's used in stir fry. Uh, to me, it has a wonderful lemony fragrance, but it tastes very bitter. So I don't use it in, in my oriental cooking, but I certainly bury my nose in it and smell deeply. It blooms in September with pink flowers that the pollinators love. So since I love to weed, to me, this is a plant I must have. Now, in this photograph, you're seeing two other, actually three other um, self-sowers with the yellow flowers. That's our native partridge pea. And, the, and you can see there's also, I think there's two uh, little coxcomb, celosia there. And then the pink flower, is we call that verbena on a stick, verbena bonariensis. And all of these plants that you're seeing here in this little vignette, they chose this place, each on their own. 
And I looked at it and said, well, you guys are right. This looks good together and we're leaving it. And, and that's what I look for is these moments that the plants have created. And then I, as the gardener, can edit and then appreciate. Poppies, yes. Now I do have some of the oriental poppies, which are perennials. And so they bloom for about 10 days and they are gorgeous and glorious when they're blooming. Uh, but then the plants kind of go away um, for the summer. And it's really the annual poppies that bring you the glory. And for those of you who knew Bernard Armstrong, uh, he was a collector, actually a hoarder even. And he had like two shoe boxes full of packets of poppy seeds that he had never planted. And so after his death, his widow Patty brought to one of our Master Gardener board meetings boxes and boxes and boxes of seeds from Bernard. And I, you know, I, I admit it, I was selfish. I pounced on those two shoe boxes of poppy seeds, brought them home, threw them all in a bucket. Now here's the secret to how you get poppies to grow. Because I don't know about you, but for like 20 years, I have been putting poppy seeds out and they never grew. Here's how you have absolute success. You, you have your poppy seeds, you wait until it snows, and you toss the poppy seeds onto the snow. And I promise you, they will come up the next year. And then year after year, they do self-seed. Uh, but if you try to get to plant poppy seeds, for whatever reason, they, the, it doesn't work. So I, have, I don't even know what all species I have. Many, many different species, and I suspect they're hybridizing in the night behind my back, but it's just amazing. Every spring, my poppies are expanding their uh, geography in my garden, all different colors, all different patterns, and it's just really a glorious look. But again, if you're a control freak, um, they're going to sow places that you didn't expect. So you have to make the decision if you can allow them there. I think a lot of you know Victoria Blue Salvia. And of course, the pollinators know it because it's salvia and they love salvia members. Um, in my garden, it, most winters, it does survive as a perennial. Um, but of course, as you'll hear when we get to horticultural technique, I am like the queen of mulching. And so they've got protection. Uh, but this is an outstanding beautiful blue and to my eye it is a true blue and they bloom from May through October and then self-seed. I mean what's not to love? Here's verbena on a stick and as you can tell from the photographs this is one of my self-sowing tender perennials that self-sows in containers and so I have many containers around my porch that are full of the verbena banariensis ben and I did not have to plant them they just come back year after year and I also sometimes dig some out of containers and go transplant them into parts of my garden that don't yet have them um, they are a perennial most winters in my garden um, but like this last winter, the two, what I would call it the 2020 winter, um, I think what really happened is in the fall, we, it, we had a day that was like 68 degrees, and then the next day it was 17 degrees for the next like week, and it knocked out a lot of my plants that ordinarily are perennials. Um, they all, none of them could handle that abrupt change in temperature. But self-seeding to the rescue, and again, they come back in all kinds of places, like in between cracks of rocks and rock gardens, places where you could never plant them yourself. They choose those spots and thrive. And then vine petunias, the original petunias. Um, the fragrance is amazing. Most of the hybrids, um, the, the fragrance is gone. And these self sow like crazy, again, they're on that list of, wow. You know, if you ever plant one, you will have them in your garden forever, unless you really are assiduous in weeding. But why would you? They come in four different colors that, and they just themselves, you can see in the photograph, I've got white, pink, and purple, and there's also a lavender, um, that they all just come up, you know, different plants, but they self sow so thickly, it all looks like the same color, I mean, different color flowers on the same plant. But that fragrance brings in the pollinators. So, the photograph there, that is one of the hummingbird moths. That one is the, uh, I don't usually know Latin names of insects, uh, but this is Manduca sexta, 
which is the tobacco hornworm. And that wing spread is as big as my hand. They have 10 inch long tongues. How can you not admire somebody with a 10 inch tongue? And again, they are primary pollinators of your night garden. They love vine petunias. Uh, zinnias, I have pretty good success with these standard zinnias, Zinnia elegans, self-sowing in my garden. Um, this last winter, they didn't. Uh, again, there are, you, you always have to have the backup plan because you can't always count on these tender perennials or self-sowers if we have an exceptionally hard winter. Um, the, the aggravating thing about them to me, of course, is the mildew. And then they can get kind of rangy, but one of the things in my horticultural technique um, is pinching them out, which means you delay the gratification of the first flowers, but boy, does it make a difference. You get a bush covered with zinnias instead of one long, lanky zinnia at the end of a long stick. Um, for your pollinators, even though my pom-pom zinnias do self-sow, the pe petals are packed so tightly <clears throat> that bees cannot get their tongue or butterflies can't get their tongues down in between the petals. So not a good choice if pollinators are one of your priorities. And of course, many of the hybrids are sterile anyway. And so here, um, I just find it easier to call it Zinnia angustifolia because I already know the name Zinnia and angustifolia is a, is, means narrow leaf and that's, the species name for a lot of plants. So it isn't a hard, to me, it's not a hard name to remember. And there's so many common names and the same common name will be for a number of different plants. Um, and this is just an outstanding plant. Uh, it is a zinnia and it forms these mounds and it self sows it comes in three different colors. You can see all three because you can just barely see some orange down under some of the white and never has mildew. Pollinators love it. I mean, this is another one of those just magical plants. Uh, most hybrids do not come true to seed. In my experience, the perfusion zinnias do. Um, the orange perfusion zinnia comes back as an orange perfusion zinnia. Likewise, the cherry perfusions, those are the only two colors I grow. And so those are the only ones that I can speak with confidence about. Uh, and they are actually a hybrid between Zinnia elegans, the standard Zinnia, and then my Zinnia angustifolia. And they have, to me, all of the virtues of the two parents, but even better because they stay fairly small and they form these mats of beautiful flowers that choke out the weeds. And this one, well, again, you talk about self-sowing. Um, these zinnia flowers are about the size of a quarter. They are a red. They grow about 18 inches long, but it's a very wiry stem. And so they don't stay standing up. They kind of relax and will just weave their way in and out among all of your other flowers. And they bring this splash of color and they absolutely can be depend upon um, to self seed no matter what the winter was like. And the pollinators really, really like them. Uh, a, another wonderful plant. So here's kind of a shot of a typical area in my garden. I did plant the bat face kufia because I love it. Um, and that's the red flower in the background. But all of the others <clears throat> chose this spot on their own. So there's um, the, the magenta balsam and there's the verbena bonariensis and I look at this and I'm like, this looks good. I wouldn't have thought of it, but the plants did and I approve. So what you will see with all of our self sowers is they need full sun. If you have a shade garden, you're not going to see the kind of vigorous growth. It takes a lot of energy to make those seeds. And so these really lush self sowing annuals are full sun and it's a full sun garden that you'll need for them. And then just the surface things here is once you have weeded out the excess, you'll want to mulch um, to keep them from, there's still lots of their seeds in the ground. And so, but you don't want them to keep coming up because then it will again need weeding. And so you heavily mulch to control too much growth. All of them do like moisture. 
Um, and so my garden is watered. I have a lake, I have a giant blue pump in the basement, I pump water from the lake. Um, and what I say to people, do not plant a garden larger than you have time to take care of and a wallet big enough to pay for watering. Don't make a garden that you cannot care of, take care of because of time or money. And so limit to what you can take care of and make magnificent rather than struggle along with too much garden or too much drought. No insecticides. If the pollinators aren't doing their job, there aren't seeds formed, flowers didn't get pollinated. And I know you all are up to speed on the impact of insecticides, especially the neonicotinoids. And now the research is not only you know, neonicotinoids impact on bees and butterflies, but also on insect eating birds. So even if you're not in love with, you know, insects like I am, I mean, I always say, if you've got six legs, I'm here for you. I am your friend. Uh, but most people do care about birds. And these in, in insecticides poison the insects and then the birds eat them, um, still alive, but poisoned and they themselves become poisoned. So it is true, I call this the no-sow garden, but you do have to plant the seeds once to get them into your environment. And people are always asking me, well, do I plant now or do I plant in the spring? And you know, with all horticultural questions, um, I really like to, before I even go to a book or the internet, is sort of look around and think, well, how does Mother Nature handle this situation? And however Mother Nature does it, because you know she's been growing flowering plants for 250 million years, I think she's got it figured out. I pretty much try to adapt her methods to my garden, um, not only because it's part of my personal philosophy, but it also cuts out a lot of work. A lot of gardeners create a lot of unnecessary work for themselves by trying to fight Mother Nature. And you know, Mother Nature, she doesn't lose. Sooner or later, she's gonna win. So better just to work in concert with her from the beginning. So uh, I don't even save seeds because you know how much I hate planting. I hate starting seeds even more. It's not gonna happen. Um, I have a greenhouse, but I use it for overwintering tropicals, my tropical perennials, never for starting seeds. And Karen, I see you waving something. I can't hear you. Hi, Lenora. Uh, ah, there you go. Because you just mentioned your greenhouse, um, we do have a question relating to that. Okay. For, for your pots, do you move your pots of the self-sowing annuals inside for the winter into the greenhouse or the garage or anything? Nope, never. Um, but there's always some explanations necessary. All of my pots are the um, polyfiber, like fiberglass or resin. None of them are ceramic or, um, which is fired terracotta or terracotta. They are all pots that you can leave outdoors and you don't have to empty them. You leave them outdoors full of the same potting mix, and of course always potting mix, never potting soil, never garden soil, and you leave them outdoors all winter long. And I'm going to be showing a photo that shows it, shows it happening, and you'll, you'll see the, the one special technique. But no, um, and I think what would happen is if I took them into the basement or the greenhouse, um, they would almost immediately sprout, and there I would be in my greenhouse, which doesn't have enough light. I mean, it's enough light for tropicals, but not for these full sun annuals. Uh, and so they would go ahead and sprout right away and it would defeat my purpose, which is to have them wait through the winter and then come up in the spring. That was a good question. Perfect, thank you so much. Anything else before we? No, uh, just a lot of kudos on what a great presentation this is. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. So when people are always saying, well, when, when should I plant the seeds? Now I recommend if you bought store-bought seeds, and so th to me that's really expensive. You know, you get like three seeds for, for $10. And so you really wanna be careful with them and not just throw them out like I do with my self-sowing annuals and choose a spot, 
and plant them in the spring and label it and really keep an eye on it. Uh, but the seeds that are coming from your plants as they grow, that's where I'm guided by Mother Nature. And so plants that go to seed in May, then if I give seeds to somebody, they should be throwing them out in May because that's when Mother Nature throws them out in May. Um, conversely, plants that go to seed in the fall, that's when Mother Nature does it. And so all of those seeds, don't save them over the winter indoors. Throw them out in your garden where you want them to be in the fall. That's what Mother Nature would have done. This is why I like having a, an audience and I can ask, does that make sense? <laughs> and see whether or not you all <laughs> smile in agreement or frown in disagreement. So how do you know how to plant seeds. And this is information I don't try to keep in my head. You know, remember, I got to remember all those botanical names, and then I got to remember my insects. So I don't try to keep details like how to plant each species of seeds in my head, because I got the seed packet. And seed companies want you to succeed. They are going to give you good information on exactly how to succeed with those seeds. Or you can always go to the internet and of course EDU sites are best. Uh, and even with EDU sites, I like to check at least two or three different sites when I'm looking for how to, because people disagree. You know, I even disagree with myself sometimes. So the first time seed planting, and I was already touching on this, um, very different from what I ordinarily am doing. If I'm bringing a new plant to my garden, and I like to start with plants because I hate planting seeds even more, um, but clear the area, but don't dig. The new horticulture is you should not be digging and definitely not tilling your soil. You should disturb your soil as little as possible for a whole bunch of reasons, one of them being that every time you turn up the soil, you're bringing weed seeds to the surface. Most of the plants that we call weeds need the sun to germinate. And they're gonna lay there, um, sometimes for even hundreds of years, and then you dig them up and give them the sun and they're gonna start taking over. And then the other thing is when you dig in the soil, you disrupt the microbial communities that are symbiotic with their, your plant's roots and you don't want to disturb those relationships. Um, so then what I recommend is you know slightly like like a fork sort of fork it and fluff it just a little on the surface most of these plants need sun to germinate but again that's why you need the seed packet to see they'll tell you if you need to bury it or leave it on the surface and then scatter the seeds in a defined pattern like a straight line even though mother nature doesn't do straight lines if that's what works for you or in a cluster and then gently tamp down with your hand and then make a label. Don't trust your memory. Um, one of the really clever ways of labeling that I have found is if you can find those bags of golf tees that are in lots of different colors, and so just make a little uh, um, schedule for yourself that all of the reds are your new zinnias and all of the blues are your new cosmos and just put the golf tee where the seeds are that you've just planted and that way you can keep track without having to write labels because written labels tend to go away during winter. Um, they can't be trusted. Um, I prefer to just wait and for natural water um, but there's times, especially if it's like in late summer, you're going to, you're going to want to keep watering. The thing is, if you start watering to get them germinating, you're going to have to keep watering. Otherwise, they'll dry out and die. So, you know, the watering is a commitment that you need to decide, will I just wait until our natural fall and winter rains come along, or am I going to get them started now? And then after the germination and you've thinned them out, then you want to mulch again uh, to keep further seeds, both the weed seeds that are always there, plus too many of your new plant from coming up. And so one of the advantages of having a defined pattern for planting and then labeling it is when they come up the first time, you're gonna know because they're in a straight line, 
or in a circle or however pattern you're using, that those are my new seedlings and there tend to be lots of them compared to the weeds, which are one, one on one. Take a photo with your smartphone and send it to yourself with the name of that plant. And then you have your record of what all of your seedlings look like. And some of them like, see how much the sunny red cosmos and the marigold look alike. And there's another native sunflower that I grow, the um, Beedens aristosa, the burr marigold, that I actually have to smell them to see, is this a marigold or a burr marigold, the wild plant? Uh, so you need to have some sort of identification system for the seedlings so that you don't, gosh, we've all done it. We planted a new plant, it went to seed, and the next year we think it's a weed and we destroy our new babies. This will help, help prevent that. The other thing you really, really, really want to start educating yourself on is what some of our common weeds look like as children. Uh, this, of course, is henbit. Uh, we also call it Kansas heather or Kansas uh, lavender. And it's beautiful on somebody else's property. Uh, this is a corn alternating with soybean field near me. And so every spring I look forward to this, but not in my garden. Um, and so this is one that comes up in the fall and you want to weed it in the fall. Uh, but it looks a lot like Creeping Charlie and um, there may be some ornamental plants. So anyway, you want to know who this is and immediately get rid of it unless you want to look like the Kansas lavender the next spring. It does no good to use uh, pesticides, herbicides in spring. You need to get rid of it in the fall. Now pinching is another one of my really important horticultural tools because when you pinch out the center of a new seedling you double it'll branch and so you double the number of leaves and the number of flowers and you also make it shorter so a lot of these you know one of the reasons they've developed hybrids is to make plants bushier and smaller especially for our smaller gardens but pinching does pretty similar thing of keeping them small and making them bushy. It's just the delayed gratification. They don't bloom as early, but, but that to me, that's okay. And I do a lot of pinching out the tops of especially that purple perella to keep it as a shorter ground cover. Plus I love the smell of those leaves. And uh, like Zinnia elegans, I was already mentioning how you, one flower on a long six, six foot stem or a Zinnia bush that's maybe three feet in diameter because you pinched out the first few flowers. It takes a lot of self-discipline and you all know this, but like when you buy flowers at a nursery and they already have a flower on the plant, you should pinch that off before you plant it so the plant will focus on developing roots and be bushier. Boy, that's hard to do because usually there's at least mm, three to four weeks before the first flowers come after the, they've been pinched like that. But, you know, delayed gratification. My mother always said you'll like it better if you have to wait for it. That's not true, but that's the kind of thing parents say. So here's containers. Yay! So these are fiberglass containers, all of them. Um, and then you see the dead that uh, was zinnia angustifolia and profusion zinnias. And... Um, there was also a vine petunia in there. And so as after the first light freeze, I pretty much consider that it's time now to focus on letting plants go to, go to sleep, have their rest or die, and uh, leaving all of the seed heads where I want them to be. And so I do that in my containers. I mean, in the old days, I would have ripped all of these out. But now I hand crush them and lay them on the top of the container. And so they're going to be mulched through the winter and they're mulching their own seeds that are underneath those stems. And then the next spring, now it means you don't have instantly, you came home from the nursery with all of these plants already in flower and you plant your containers. And they, so you have blooms even by middle of May. Uh, one of the reasons I, I could never do a spring garden tour is because I have, have oh, I choose to wait for all of these plants to wake up themselves and grow enough to bloom themselves. But then I, I didn't have to do anything to this with the profusions, the petunias and the zinnia angustifolia. They just all came themselves in that container. And I'm so busy, you know, weeding, 
and even though I hate planting, which makes it even worse, I usually I usually plant about a thousand annuals every spring because I have, yes, I know it's ridiculous, uh, but I have this vision of what my garden has to look like. And so those plants that don't self sow, I've got to plant them because I, you know, I'm not going to compromise on my vision. And so I'm so busy doing that that all my containers are kind of left because I know they're going to take care of themselves. The one problem with, to, in my mind, with the self sowing, I don't mind if they go other places in my garden beds and make new friends and new color combinations, but they love pathways and driveways. One of the reasons that I paid the big bucks to have my driveway covered with asphalt is because all my self-seeding annuals were trying to move their show out there. And so um, I hate spraying Roundup. I mean, I still use Roundup, but um, I would much rather find other ways to deal with it. I love hand weeding, but when you have a huge garden, sometimes that gets to be too much. And so Roundup especially in early spring when the, these are larkspurs and they came up in the fall. And so before anything else is alive and in danger of me over roundupping, then I can round up. Um, as the, as the self-sowers get bigger, and of course I'm always like, I have a long list. I'm always behind in my, I'm always at least one growing season behind in my garden. It's really easy to weed these self-sowers out of paths when the plants get a little bit bigger and you can just grab them and they pull right out by handfuls. And, and it's a good feeling. I always, for those of us who pluck our eyebrows and you know how good it feels to get a hold of that hair with the tweezers and pull it out. It's a good feeling. Dennis doesn't know about this feeling. Um, it's the same with weeding out these self sowers is you grab a handful of them and you pull them out and it's just really satisfying. So of course my self sowers, they plant themselves so much thicker than you ever would. And so it blocks most of the weeds from growing. And so again, they start to take care of themselves. And then when these die, they're going to form their own mulch. So mulch is absolutely, in my mind, probably the most important of our horticultural tools. Uh, Mother Nature mulches. When you look out in, past, in, in prairies or in woodlands, you almost never see naked ground. There's almost always a covering of organic matter. And that comforts the plants and it feeds the plants. And, usually, and what happens with mulch is it becomes compost and then it eventually becomes soil. And as part of that process, it's microbes and uh, small critters like roly-poly bugs all eating the dead debris and eventually making soil. And there's all of the nutrients then in that soil that feeds the plants. You know, people ask me, that could, okay, I'm, again, I'm, I'm not gonna be modest. You look at my garden, it is extremely lush. And so people immediately wanna know what fertilizer do you use? Because somehow, I guess the advertisers or people want to believe in magic. And so they believe that a fertilizer is the answer. Fertilizer is never the answer. Uh, and if you have to fertilize your soil, that means you're not feeding your soil because fertilizer is not plant food. Plant food is made by the plants. That's what photosynthesis does. Fertilizer is more like taking vitamins, which most of us don't need to do because we eat a healthy diet and we get our vitamins in our food naturally. And the same with your plants. If you're feeding the soil by these layers of mulch that become compost, that become soil, the nutrients are in the soil. And the best mulch for any plant is last year's dead body of that same plant because it has all the nutrients that plant is going to need for the next year. And there's just so many reasons not to use synthetic fertilizers. Um, and I'm not gonna read you the list because it's there for you, but a couple things. First of all, the synthetic fertilizers um, are supplying nitrogen. And that is the one nutrient that plants can't make for themselves. Um, that's why they have friends, the beneficial nitrogen fixing bacteria grab the nitrogen out of the sky. And then when the plant tells them, the plants and the bacteria are talking all the time. They just don't use words, they use molecules to talk to each other. And so the plant tells the microbes, you know, I think I'm going to make some amino acids today. 
if you would be so kind as to get me some nitrogen. And the microorganisms say, well, that's really a good idea. If you would just hand me some carbohydrate, I will give you some nitrogen. So it's this constant bartering between the plants and the microbes. When you use synthetic fertilizer with nitrogen in it and you pour it on the plant and the plants, you know, still needs the, the bacteria to get that nitrogen into the cells. And so the plant says to its bacteria, okay, um, I need some nitrogen today. And the bacteria look around and they say, well, there's nitrogen everywhere here. You don't need me. And it actually shuts down the natural nitrogen fixing cycle when you use these synthetic fertilizers. The other thing it does, and a lot of this research was done by Dr. Cloyd, our own Dr. Raymond Cloyd out at K-State, is when you use synthetic fertilizer, it also shuts down um, the plant's production of what we call volatiles, which are chemicals that plants produce that repel insect pests. And you actually shut that down when you use synthetic fertilizers. So, I mean, just, I mean, those are just two of the big reasons to use natural organic materials as your fertilizer. Now, people also get concerned um, they think that by just letting plants choose where they're going to be, that their garden will be, as I say, a hot mess. Um, no. Well, I don't think mine is a hot mess. I, I call my gardening style controlled chaos. Um, but what it demands is that you have strong design, that it's very obvious the shapes uh, of the beds and the trails in your garden. And so you do that with your hardscaping. If you've got strong hardscaping just defining the growing areas, then it doesn't matter if the plants are running amok. It will still look controlled and organized. And the human brain needs controlled and organized. And when our eye looks at us at something, we try it's just natural, it's hardwired into us. We try to see patterns. And so you want to establish those patterns, even though you're allowing the plants to choose where they want to be. And so again, a strong design defined by the hardscaping and then deadheading and mulching. Um, all of these are to control where the plants are growing. And then you will always need to weed. And that's why I don't call this low maintenance gardening is because you will need to weed. The thing is, every plant I pull up as a weed, and usually they're just excess of the plants I want, but then I immediately lay them down in that same bed as mulch. They become mulch. And so most of the things I do in my garden are multitasking. I'm first like weeding, but then I'm mulching with the materials. I mean, the idea of getting this big pile of weeds I've pulled out of my garden and then taking it over to the compost pile, waiting a year, and then bringing it back. That's really stupid. That's a lot of work. You compost in place. You put all of that mulch right where it was growing, and then you're sure that the right nutrients are going to be there for the right plants. So here again, talking about your garden design and how important it is. And now I know a lot of you are proud of being ploppers. I'm sorry, I was just toilet trained too early to be a plopper. You know, part of my very early and strict toilet training is that gardens are not about plants. My mother was a landscape designer. Plants are the very last thing you think about when you design a garden. What you think about first is function. What do you want that garden to do for you? And it is your garden, so you get to choose. And then the shapes, the forms, those are all to fulfill the function. And so then when you have your shapes and your functions defined, then it's time to think about, okay, what plants will give me the effect that I'm going for? So plants are your final decision, not your first decision. And I know for many of you, your idea of planning is planning what you're going to wear when you go to the nursery and just start grabbing plants and putting them in your basket. No, you know, um, even my, impulse buys are already on a list on a piece of paper. You know, no plant comes home with me unless there is an X on the master plan of where that plant is going to be. Because I have a very mature garden, every bit of real estate already has plants in it. And so for me, if a plant dies, 
there's a moment of, you know, grief and pain, but it wasn't my grandmother. It was just a plant. And now I have space for a new plant. Hooray. And so I will spend as much as a year researching, studying. I can't believe all of the people who buy plants and know nothing about them. I mean, buying a plant, bringing a plant to your garden is establishing a relationship. And like, would you marry somebody? And if you knew nothing about their family or their personal habits? No. And it's the same with a plant. You should never buy a plant unless you know about its family and know about its personal habits. And that's all research that you do before you buy the plants. Okay. Most of you are going to ignore me. I accept that. It is your garden, your choice. Let's keep going. But do you like this wonderful color that's sort of like a tapestry? Or what I see a lot of, uh, mulch gardens, where the mulch actually takes precedence over the plants. And each plant is meticulously groomed and has its own little space. And then this large area of mulch in between the plants. Well, and what happens then when you have that uniform store-bought mulch is if even a leaf falls on it, it looks dirty and you end up spending as much time cleaning your mulch and caring for your mulch as you do for taking care of your plants. But again, it is your garden and you get to make choices about what works for you. What works for me is to try to adapt to what mother nature wants for me and my plants and then we're going to do well with this minimum of work. Um, so first of all, the hardscaping and by now, in fact, you no longer can see most of my hardscaping except beds. And here's a, here's a truism for you. You keep the edges of your beds groomed so you can see whatever material it is, whether it's logs. I use logs in my shade garden. I use rocks in my sun garden. You can see that edge. People will see your garden and they will think you are a wonderful gardener and meticulously groomed doesn't matter what's happening with the plants. And like, well, Dennis knows, I visited Joyce Householder's garden last week and she's saying, oh, and this garden's so full of weeds. I didn't see any weeds. You know, as a visitor, everything looks like it belongs there. She's got these nice neat edges. I knew exactly where the garden bed was. I didn't see any weeds. You can get away with so much if you just keep those edges pristine. So the mulch and Dennis and I are just so in concert here, two to four inches. Most people do not use enough mulch. If you use just a thin skim layer of mulch, what that does is creates a wonderful growing opportunity for the weeds. It needs to be thick enough that it will, that it will prevent the sun from stimulating those weed seeds into germinating. It also uh, conserves moisture it also keeps the roots cooler. And so again, lots of mulch is a win-win. Now, the reason I, I know this about you, you're cheap. And so you've bought your mulch. You know, you really should never have to buy mulch if you have a mature garden. There should be enough garden debris that you, I never buy mulch. I don't need to. My garden produces its own mulch. But you have to buy mulch when it's a new garden. And it's expensive. And so you go cheap and spread an inch instead of spreading the two to four inches that you really need to, to control those weeds. The other thing is, I'd never seen, I, I came here from Michigan. I had never seen wood chips used as mulch. So right, right away, I'm like, oh really? And then I'm looking around, does mother nature use wood chips as mulch? No, she does not. No plant evolved with wood chips as their mulch. Mother Nature uses last year's dead bodies, shreds of leaves, shreds of stems. That's what plants evolve to have as mulch. And then again, that mulch turns into soil. Wood chips, unfortunately, form a hard crust. The mycelium of fungus sort of glues them together. So there's this hard crust that the rain can't penetrate. And if you don't have a thick enough layer, the weeds still come through because it keeps the ground moist. And so, I mean, the new thought in horticulture is plants do care about what you've mulched with, and wood chips are wonderful for paths, but should never be used to mulch plants. Your garden, your choice. And may I say just categorically, 
if you're going to buy wood chips, do not buy dyed wood chips. I, I just, I just can't deal with it. Oh, Karen, I see you. Are you making signals that we have a question? Yes, um, because you've been talking about the mulch of your plants. Can you please clarify when you deadhead, as you said that you do constantly, do you just drop the spent blooms into the garden? Absolutely, right under the plant it was growing on. Okay. You know, ag again, that's why I don't have to buy mulch because I'm constantly mulching as I go. Um, and the difference between mulch and compost, um, I sometimes get that question. Mulch, you can tell that it was a pl it was plant material. You can still see bits of leaves and stems. It's in the process. Compost, you can't tell what plant it was. It's, you know, you can tell that it is organic matter, but it no longer has an identity. And then of course, soil, actually you can tell by the feel of soil, whether or not it has gone all the way back to minerals and no longer has the or um, a high percentage of organic matter. So it's a natural progression from mulch, which is very coarse, and I hand shred, I mean, perfect time. Here's, here's my slide, here's what my one, I have, let's see, I'm up to 23 gardening rooms, because I do like to be organized. And so this is my wall garden, because there is a brick wall, which I had built by a mason. Um, and I've let everything go. You know, it's in February. I did not do any so-called cleanup in fall. My garden is not dirty. It does not need cleaning. My garden needs grooming, as we all do. Um, so I leave everything until February. And by February, Mother Nature has already started the process for me. And so it's very easy with just my hands. These were um, the um, fireworks Penicetum rubrum, if you know that hybrid, it is, you would call it an annual grass. Uh, it is actually a tender perennial, so it will not overwinter outdoors, and so it dies to the ground, and it makes the most wonderful mulch, and it's so easy, just my hands, to just crumble it up. And likewise, that's Paravzia, the Russian sage, the silvery-looking plant. By February, just with my hands, no tools necessary. I can just break that up into little pieces and drop it down. So pieces, people ask me, how big is your mulch? Well, I say the width of my hand. Here's my little gnarly hand here. That's the size that when I'm breaking up mulch with my hands, it breaks up to the width of my hand and that's what goes on the ground. Uh, if you like a more refined look, you could put, you could gather leaves and run them through a a chipper shredder so you get a uniform ground up leaf and top all of this with ground leaves to give a more uniform look if if you like it to have that I would, I'm going to say tidier look um, but but I've been doing it this way I'm going to say for at least 20 years and so this is what works for me in my garden and I wish I had adjacent to this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a slide next time and show what this garden then will look like this year in the growing season, and I'll plant nothing, but what it will look like coming up through this mulch. So again, we like, we humans like things to be organized, and so you can take control of where plants come up and in what patterns they come up. And so you can do it in ribbons, um, that's when we're doing big sweeps of color. Or if you want to define shapes with uh, more geometric, and those of you who like a more formal look will want to go geometric. Um, and so how do you do this with self-sewing? Well, so here's my bed of uh, the sunny cosmos. And so that's probably February, early, you know, February, early March. And I just left it all. And so then I'm going to go in and hand crunch it, you know, using my hand. And so that's what it looks like now. It's mulch. And that only, that only takes like a few minutes. And it's, to me, you know, I'm outdoors in my garden and I've started the process of turning debris into mulch. So life is good. And I do it sitting down because I'm old and, you know, 
it's, it's just so much easier than using machines and then fighting with stuff that isn't yet ready to be degraded because it's freshly dead in the fall. If you wait until winter, Mother Nature has already started decaying this material. And so then I decided that I want a particular shape of ribbon for my cosmos. And so I use my hand and create these bare spots, uh, well, almost bare, because I leave just a little bit, you know, just a few stems and leaves so that the ground isn't totally naked. And so the sun is going to hit and warm up the exposed earth more quickly, and those cosmos will come up. And in the meantime, I've added to the layer of mulch by sweeping some aside. And so this controls very much where your flowers will come up. So you see, you really do have a lot of control. So here's um, one spot in my garden um, and the space of over 17 years. Remember, I've planted nothing. I've done nothing except weed in these. These are the same spot and how it's changed over the years. And so originally there was a lot of melon podium. There's celosia, there's some marigolds, there's some cleome. And then moving to 2010, the cleome is exerting itself and somehow some perella strolled over from another garden bed. And at that point, I also had monardia, the pink, the shorter pink is monarda lombata, which is an annual monarda that self sows. Another one of my favorite plants, but you know, I say that about so many plants. And, and then vine petunias had moved in. And then by 2017, well, I had brought some Euphorbia marginata, that's the snow on the mountain, the big white, those aren't really flowers, they're bracts, it's a native prairie plant. And I had brought some in and of course had spread those seeds in a completely different part of my garden, but it thought it would be really happy hanging out with the Cleome, moved over to that area. And again, I didn't have to do the work other than weeding, and I get these different looks that to me are very exciting. Um, and it's what Mother Nature, how Mother Nature wanted my garden to look this, this next year. So here's looking at the same space uh, year through, through the seasons of a year. And so you already have seen um, a couple other shots of this garden um, full of flowers. Again, started in 2015. Um, I had a couple loads of topsoil brought in and then uh, I had a man in his big tractor with a front end loader go out into my prairie and harvest great big rocks to use as the edges and laid it down and then threw seeds out. And then this is what came back the second year and continues to come back. It looks a little different every year, but that's what it would look like in July. And then after everything dies, after the hard frost in November, it's all the same plants are still there. They're just brown and I just leave them. And then usually I get to it late February, middle of March. Then I go in and hand crush everything. And it's not as obvious in the photograph where everything's brown, but there's a lot of ornamental grasses. That's mulch, people. Why are you spending money on got ornamental grasses that easily break up with your hands and you lay down as mulch and you're feeding your garden? Um, to me, that makes no sense. And so anyway, it, it would take me like an afternoon, and it's a pretty big garden, to break up all of the debris and have everything mulched, and then I'm ready. And I usually don't do, I showed you making patterns, but I just use really heavy mulch. And so that controls the numbers of seeds that come up through the mulch. And that keeps me from having to do as much weeding because a lot of the plants never germinate because of the mulch. Again, you have to kind of play with how heavy, how thickly do I want the plants to come up, but you have control over that by how heavily you mulch. And so again, another example, you've already seen my uh, sunny red cosmos as dead and then made into mulch with the crushing. And then just, a, you know, two months later, here it is. Now, in theory, when you see May seeds, you see where all of those little seedlings are germinating. In theory, I go in and thin those. In practice, I got a long list. I'm an old, decrepit, and feeble lady. I never get to it, and so they just come up and they kind of manage themselves. So a lot of, I found a lot of garden tasks, if you don't get to them, Mother Nature kind of resolves the issues and you end up not having to do any work uh, on it. Just, again, 
keeping that edge absolutely clean. I have weeded that edge, so it's always in view. And so it doesn't matter how wild and crazy those plants get. Now, you wouldn't want every single part of your garden to have that same look. I mean, that would be boring. And so I do have other parts of my garden that look very different, that I manage very differently. You know, I do have my elephant ear garden in partial shade, and I have my rose garden, although I have to admit, rose rosette is taking a toll. And I'm gonna switch, you know, at my age, you start to look for ways like, how can I keep doing this myself? I'm enough of a control freak that I do want to do it myself and I love doing it myself. So how can I switch from roses, which aren't really high maintenance, but still something easier? Well, I'm gonna start putting in more and more of my ornamental grasses and I'm gonna use annual grasses. First of all, for that color, there's no native grass that looks like fireworks penicetum and vertigo penicetum. If I'm gonna have brilliant red grass and dark black grass, I'm gonna to have to use those annuals, but then they become the mulch. So it's a win-win. And then I have areas that um, I grow my xerotropic plants, plants that don't like wet soil, like it really dry. So I'm not gonna use heavy mulch there because that holds the moisture. And again, you get a very different look, but it's your garden and you are in control of all of that. So where do you get seeds? And that's the question I get all the time. Um, I don't save seeds because I'm just going to let mother nature do her thing. And then if I want, like if I want my dame's rocket somewhere else in my garden or my larkspur, I'm, at, I'm moving it into more and more places in my garden. I just, when I rip up the plant when it's dead, I just carry and lay its dead body down in the bed where it's going to become mulch. And then the seeds are there and they're going to come up and life is good. But there's times I want to try a new plant. And every year I try to plant a couple new plants just to keep my horizons expanding. And you never know when you're gonna find a new best friend. And so these are the two companies, uh, Select Seeds and Seed Savers Exchange. They are both wonderful companies who've been around for quite a while. Um, in fact, Seed Savers Exchange, they're in Decorah, Iowa, and they are doing the warehousing of thousands of species of plants, both ornamental and um, native, in, in case something happens to our planet, that we have seeds to be able to start over. And all of these sell only uh, open pollinated, self-sowing type of plants. Um, if you go to the internet, you have to read the fine print and be sure what you're getting is an open pollinated, which means it'll be self-seeding uh, plant. Um, to me, it's just easier to go to select seeds and seed savers. And then again, if you're collecting native plant seeds, whenever the plant, you know, you wait until the seeds are ripe. The mistake a lot of people wait is they harvest the seeds before they've turned brown. I mean, brown, not still sort of green. They have to be all the way ripe. And then that's the time of year nature, mother nature is gonna sow them. So that's when you should be throwing them out in your garden, not saving them through the winter in an envelope. Um, a lot of these seeds also do need to be striated, which means they need the winter. They need at least six weeks of below freezing. And so that's another way of making sure, instead of having to count the weeks of the plant on a damp paper towel in your refrigerator, you just have it outdoors going with the natural process. So we got, we've gotten to the end. Um, I would not represent this as low maintenance gardening because you will be weeding. Uh, and you will be, instead of buying bags of mulch, you will be hand breaking up plant debris in your garden and laying it down as your mulch. But the rewards to me are just tremendous. First of all, I am in, totally in love with pollinators. And, you know, by having all of these open pollinated plants for them, they, they know this is their garden. And you can get your garden certified as a pollinator garden by the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, highly recommend them. And then of course, for me, I got my eye candy. I'm gonna have brilliant flowers from about the middle of April all the way to the hard frost. And sometimes even to Thanksgiving, I have this kind of color. So we have done it. Um, Karen, do we have questions? Well, Lenore, we have way more kudos and compliments to you Ooh. and your presentation 
than Thank you. the questions, although we will open it up to questions from the Master Gardeners in just a second. The only lingering question that I have was, do you also drop the weeds onto your garden when pulling? Okay, so here's the deal. I love to weed. When I see a weed, I am on it, and it's not yet gone to seed. If the weed has gone to seed, I pull it and carry it over to the burn barrel. I never would drop weed seeds into my garden. And so I have very, very few weeds because I've been heavy mulching and allowing no weeds to go to seed for at least 20 years. So for me, it's exciting to see a weed. Oh, I get to pull a weed. You know? Now that's except for my paths, which are full of weeds. Um, but I do use preen. Uh, preen really works well on gravel paths and on like pavers paths where there's uh, spaces between the pavers. You fill those spaces with preen. Um, I know people who don't want to use and they'll use things like corn gluten. Um, in my experience, it's not nearly as effective as preen. I don't find as much success with preen on my paths that are wood chips, and I'm not sure why. It could be that I just don't preen heavily enough. Um, but I walk my garden almost every day, and it takes me a long time because the minute I see a weed, I pull it. I don't wait and say, I'm going to come back. I pull it immediately, and that way they never get a chance to go to seed. My husband used to hate walking behind me in the garden because he was constantly being bumped by my rump as I leaned over to pull another weed. We're going to open up the presentation if you'd like to ask Lenora some questions. Uh, I'm going to ask one first, Lenora. Uh, uh -huh. as, a, as a person who loves pollinators, one of the questions I get a lot and I've not heard a really good definitive answer when do you clean up in the spring for the overwintering uh, cocoons, pupa right, cakes, right. those types of things? I notice your pictures and we're doing that in February, but a lot say later. So what's your take on that? Mm -hmm. Well, what you're especially worried about are all of the pollinators that overwinter in hollow stems. But with my technique, even when I take them down, I'm not grinding them up. I'm breaking them into palm sized lengths. And so the stems are still there on the surface as mulch, and the pollinators are still intact in their stems. And they, so I'm not just doing the kind of destroying that people typically do under the guise of cleaning up. Um, usually, and usually by, I'm going to say, mid April, 1st of May, most of those pollinators will have emerged, although that's not true of the bees. I mean, bees, we have 400 species of native bees here in eastern Kansas. You know, everybody thinks honeybees are the bees. No, honeybees aren't even native. They were brought here in 1622. They are wonderful. I love honeybees. But native bees evolved here with our native plants. They are far more efficient pollinators. And in the honeybee hive, it's like eternal because each honeybee lives about six weeks but it's replaced after it dies. With our native bees, they li the adults live about six weeks, which is long enough to mate, lay eggs, feed the larvae, the larvae pupate, and the adults die. And then it's another 11 months before the pupa hatches as an adult and starts the cycle over. So that's why you don't see masses of native bees. They're all taking their turns. So like leaf cutter bees, they don't even come out of pupation until temperatures are over 85. So in August is when you see your leaf cutter bees. But if you're managing your garden in a more natural way, you know, you're going to be managing in concert with mother nature and those leaf cutter bees are going to make it because you haven't destroyed what the garden was by a cleanup. Did, did that help? I might have rambled a little. <laughs> never, never. Okay, anything else? We're there good? Was question, there was a question, do you also grind up by hand grind all the native grasses too? I'm assuming the answer is yes to that. Yes, the, the ones that are in my garden proper, um, because I have, you know, my prairie reimagined. Uh, my property was a tall grass prairie, but uh, was turned into a pasture about 70 years ago before we bought it. 
and most of the native prairie plants destroyed, but you rarely can't recreate a prairie. It's too complex of an ecosystem. But what you can do is reimagine it by planting natives. And also you can use ornamentals that live in that same e ecosystem. And so I have the prairie reimagined, which I would never go in and treat like a garden. You know, it's treated like a prairie, which means some years I burn and some years I have it cut, which is analogous to having it grazed by ungulates. Uh, but in the garden, all the native grasses that now have been turned into ornamental plants. To me, the distinction is not, are you a native or an ornamental from some foreign country? It's where are you being placed and what is your purpose? And if you're placed in a garden, whether you're a native plant or an ornamental, you should be managed the same, which means groomed. If you are being managed as a native plant in a native environment, and I have all four ecosystems on purpose here on my farm, then I manage them like mother nature would, which is usually grazing or mowing and fire. I will go on and on if you ask me questions, won't I? <laughs> Are we done? Is there anyone else? Last chance. Again, I extend my invitation. Um, we can do the big group. I think we had, what, 79 when you all came in 2017 or 18? Yeah. But if smaller groups of you want to just informally organize and just email me and, you know, I like to have at least four or five people you know, I don't have time for one-on-one, -on -one, quite honestly. But a, a small group, because the big groups, it, and we used a microphone, but then you, you don't have that personal one-on-one -on -one experience. And of course, a lot of people who come to see the garden, their real interest is in the pollinators. And so, you know, we need to be able to gather around the, you know, tangled vein fly or the carpenter bee, or right now, the clear wing bumblebee moth which is a bumblebee mimic. They are out pollinating my flowers and they are so adorable. So quite honestly, because of social distancing, um, tours are difficult because we get excited and we forget because we all want to gather around that caterpillar <laughs> or that pollinator. Uh, but I'm up for it. So just you know, let me know, we'll wear our masks and, and do it. Any other questions? If not, Laura, Nora, thank you again. This was, thank uh, you. Sorry, this is Lenora's first Zoom presentation. Yay. And I think, uh, as I said earlier on the chat line, I think she knocked it out of the ballpark. Oh, and good. Thank you. You, yeah, the, the comment box is just flooded with uh, high fives for you. Uh, about thank you. Again. So, yeah. well, uh, I'm going to stop recording now. And I'm going to go to stop share.